G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. The preseason is officially over. It is the week of opening round, and in today's video, I'm going to go through each team in the AFL and give you a brief summary of how their preseason games went, starting with Adelaide all the way through the Western Bulldogs, and just covering, you know, the general narratives that came out of this weekend, you know, who played well, what are some injury concerns, what went right, what didn't. A very brief look at it, and, and more just trying to focus on the things that mattered. So to preview what's going to happen, this is the first week of the footy season. In addition to this video, I'm going to be doing my footy tipping series once again. That should come out on the channel later today. And you should also be aware we've got a footy tipping competition fired up. Anyone who wants to be a part of it, I'll leave the link in the pinned comment of this video. And then we've got a separate footy tipping competition for members only. And while I'm on that note, I do want to shout out three new members who joined the channel recently in Rotor Wash, Power Ninja, and Samantha. So thank you so much for supporting the channel. And if there are members of True Footy out there who haven't seen that we have a members only footy tipping competition. If you go to the community tab on this YouTube channel, you see a couple of members only posts with the password. But enough of that, let's get into talking about how each team went this preseason. So we'll start off with the Adelaide Crows. They had two games naturally, and the first one was a draw with Port Adelaide, 93 apiece. At least by the end of the four quarters, they kept playing for a little bit longer than that. And then they had a convincing win over West Coast in the second weekend. Can I just say, I know it's preseason, but I think the fact that Adelaide and Port Adelaide drew in a preseason showdown does kind of speak to this interesting battle between these two sides this year. Maybe this is just my perspective, but we're going to see some red hot showdowns this year and them finishing with a draw seems very fitting to me. But in particular, if I had to isolate, you know, individual standouts for me, Isaac Rankin looks like he's set for a massive year. We saw him play a fair bit of midfield time against Port Adelaide and then against West Coast. Again, he had like 20 touches, four goals, and I'm pretty sure they parked him at three quarter time. This guy's going to be set for an unreal season. I'm a big fan of him. And then on top of that, you had the reliable types in Dawson and Led. They played well, as you'd expect. And then there's a few other players, maybe not locked into their 22. I thought Lockie Scholl against West Coast was really good. 23 touches and a goal. Sam Berry was also good. I think he had two goals and 22 touches. And both of these guys are fighting for spots in round one. The sour news to come out of it is that late in the game against West Coast, Riley Stillthorpe went down with a bit of a knee scare. And as far as I can tell, he's going to miss at least round one. The, the scan came back and it's a damaged meniscus. We don't know anything further than that, but he's not going to be available for the early parts of the season. As for the Brisbane Lions, you know, their preseason went pretty swift swimmingly, you'd have to say. So they had two clashes, one against the Gold Coast Suns. They won that by eight goals, and then they overcame Sydney by four goals. So while we're not reading too much into results this time of year, you'd have to say no real blips on the radar. You know, one thing that came out of the game against Gold Coast was Cam Rayner playing a little bit more on ball, like exclusively on ball, and, and played pretty well. That game didn't have any recorded stats, but some other notable performances were Hugh McCluggage in the second game against Sydney. Again, contract year, I've highlighted he might be one to have a huge year for the Brisbane Lions. Kitty Coleman also sort of continued the form that we saw, you know, particularly in that grand final. He looks like he's going to have a good year. And then Kai Lohman as well as a bit of a role player, not established in this 22 by any stretch of the imagination, but really caught the eye as a, as a pressure player. I think he had six tackles, forward line and back. And James Tunstall was another one that could bolt up for an early game this year. Other interesting aspects, we saw Darcy Gardner play as a third taller in the first game at least. Didn't have a massive impact, but it's interesting to see Brisbane are sort of experimenting, you know, with Gunston having now left the club. It's also worth noting that Lockie Neal, who had a bit of a groin complaint prior to this preseason, played quite well against Sydney and, you know, he's going to be there for round one. Then we've got Carlton, who probably had a bit of a lackluster preseason in terms of the fixtures and the results. Not that there's anything really to read into that. Having said that, they did go down to the Cats by 17 points and then lost to the Demons by 38 points. And I think the bigger concern here for Carlton is there's a little bit of doubt over some of their soldiers. On the plus side, we saw, you know, Mackay. There were some moments, he, you know, he was shanking it, but he had three goals and 18 touches against the Demons. That's positive. You know, Charlie Kerno was also good with three goals. Paddy Cripps, unsurprisingly, was a strong performer, but Ollie Hollands as well. I think he had 16 disposals against the Demons and looks like he's continuing to develop and should feature early, you'd think, for Carlton. There are a few little niggles that they're going to be a little bit worried about. We've heard Sam Walsh is still on a modified training program. Jack Martin and Matt Owies are both in a little bit of doubt, as is Caleb Marchbank for their round one opener. Corey Durden's also injured, so just a few little niggles on top of Jacob Wiedering not being available for the start of the season. Then we got the reigning premiers in Collingwood. So their first battle was against North Melbourne and they lost that game by 34 points. Again, just pre-season and you know, a lot of new faces being cycled into that team. So in that game, we did see Ash Johnson and Reef McInnes both kick three goals. It does seem like Ash Johnson might be the front runner to get a game. I'm not sure if Collingwood would roll with both of them, but that was a particular point of interest for me. And they also signed their SSP signing in Lockie Sullivan, who played well against North too. In their second game, they had a pretty convincing five goal win over the Tigers and the familiar names of Dugowie and Dacos played well. On top of that though, we saw some pretty strong performances from Pat Lipinski. He had two goals and 23 touches. And Will Hoskin Elliott was one of their best on ground 
against the Tigers. A couple of little niggles to guys like Bobby Hill and Tom Mitchell. I think there was a hamstring for Hill and a rolled ankle for Mitchell, but both are expected to play round one. Then we've got Essendon, and their first game was against St Kilda, and that was a fairly underwhelming result. They lost that game by 11 goals, but then had a much more improved performance against the Cats, only losing that game by 12 points. We did see Nick Martin deployed in this halfback role for the first time. We've been hearing about this this offseason, and that definitely looks to have made a promising start. Uh, in terms of their team news, we know that Sam Draper might be in doubt for round one, as I currently understand it, which means that the recruitment of Todd Goldstein this offseason could prove to be one of the best value selections of last year's offseason. On a positive note, there's a lot of talk about how Sam Durham went, you know, previously a bit more of a wingman. Gives Essendon a little bit of a different look in that midfield. There is some more sour news in terms of availability for round one. Jordan Ridley, I think it was a quad injury. He was put on ice in three quarter time against the Cats and the results come back. It looks like he's been cleared of serious damage, but is described as being in extreme doubt for round one. Then there was Fremantle. They had a big 52 point win over the Eagles at Lathlane in the first game before going down to the power by 39 points. I'd say I describe it as a solid preseason outing for Fremantle. You know, Port Adelaide are a formidable appointment in any way. And while it wasn't the best performance, you do highlight that they had a few players missing like Jai Amos, Luke Jackson, and Michael Frederick. I mean, those are only just three players, but you know, I think Fremantle had five marks inside 50 against Port Adelaide and those players are important forwards for them. There is probably a lot more positives than negatives, I would have thought. You know, I think Hayden Young's move to the midfield looks very promising. There's always a little bit of doubt when you try and move a halfback flanker into the midfield. Not every player can make that transition, but from what I've seen of Hayden Young, there looks to be no doubt that he's going to make that transition successfully. And against Port Adelaide, he was probably their best player, 26 touches and two goals. And there's a few other role players that I think bobbed up and made a good case for Fremantle this offseason. I think guys like Tom Emmett was very noticeable against West Coast and Jeremy Sharp's been solid. There's also Patrick Voss, who was taken, I think, as a delisted free agent or SSP. Lots of little wins there, but I think as well, the return of Nat Fife to the midfield and talk of his body being better than it has in a number of years. You know, parking the fact that I'm an Eagles fan, if I was a Fremantle fan, that would give me some excitement. So he moves two big bodies into this midfield of Hayden Young and Nat Fife that has a very clear your role and adds value to this team. That's going to be one to watch for Fremantle going into 2024. Then we've got the Cats, okay? So they beat Carlton by 17 points and then beat Essendon by 12 points in their two preseason games. It has come at a cost. Cam Guthrie got injured eight seconds into that game against Carlton and has been ruled out, I think, with eight to 10 weeks with a quad injury. I've talked about the midfield depth, you know, going into this season quite extensively. So for Cam Guthrie, their best midfielder to miss eight to 10 weeks is a pretty cruel blow. On the plus side, I thought Jai Clark was quite prominent against Essendon. He had about 17 touches at 94% efficiency. So it does create an opportunity for him perhaps. And I do think one of the standouts for them is Max Holmes, who I think is on track to have a really good year, forecasting him to be playing a little bit more halfback. That's the way he was played in this offseason. And his speed and, you know, his distribution was really strong. So I think that could be a bit of a secret weapon for the Cats going into this year. Oli Dempsey also put his hand up for round one with a strong offseason. As far as team news goes, Oli Dempsey also rolled his ankle, I think, at training and is expected to play round one. The Gold Coast Suns then had a little bit of a lackluster preseason, it has to be said, in terms of their results, which we can't read too much into. But a 47-point loss to the Brisbane Lions and then a 44-point loss to GWS, admittedly two very strong sides. But if we look past the results and just look for, you know, positives this offseason, I think Bailey Humphrey showed a little bit to suggest Suggest he's going to be a good player again, which is not necessarily groundbreaking news. But Alex Sexton moving to the back line will be an interesting one especially for fantasy players. He had 31 disposals against the Giants, 634 meters gained. And on top of that, I thought Jack Lukosius again continued his strong progression as a forward. Don't forget, he's only been in that role for 12 months. 39 goals last year, he kicked three in the first quarter against the Giants. And then after that, Gold Coast kind of got rolled over. We'll speak about the Giants now. They lost their first game to Sydney by 26 points before then smashing the Gold Coast Suns by 44. A couple of green shoots for some young guys. Leek Lear, a little bit of a forgotten high draft pick from a few years ago, had some promising form, as did Aaron Cadman. I think we can be patient with Cadman, but again, I said in another video, I think he attended a few center bounces as a midfielder, and I do think I can be optimistic about what he can add to this team as a third tall forward. Obviously, long term, we should be optimistic, but I mean more so in 2024. And then we had a few strong performances from guys like Tom Green, not a big surprise, but Xavier O'Halloran was also quite prominent. The Giants did hold a few players out of this game against the Gold Coast Suns, guys like Callahan and Perryman, and I'm not really too sure where they sit in terms of fitness for opening round. But it does look like Brent Daniels, who appeared to get 
injured against the Gold Coast Suns should be okay for opening round. Let's talk about the Hawks. They played the Bulldogs twice. I'm not 100% sure why, but they lost the first one by 25 and then lost the second one by 57 points. Now, I think the big interesting thing with Hawthorne, the big watch for me, is going to be, you know, how they find a backline solution with, you know, James Blank doing that ACL. But we've seen a couple of players trialed in there. Ethan Phillips came in and was a little bit promising, although we can't expect too much. And also, Jason Wrong was trialed down there as a bit of a key defender. So that will be interesting to see how they shape up in round one. John Newcomb did show signs of maybe taking his game to another level in 2024. I think he had 37 and 7 clearances in the second game against the Bulldogs. Ginevan kicked a couple of goals. Mitch Lewis and Connor McDonald were somewhat prominent. And we did see a bit of Massimo D'Ambrosio as well. He had 18 touches. So aside from that, not a whole lot to report from Hawthorne. Again, I'm, I'm interested to see how they shape up round one. Hopefully for their sake, they can unearth one of Sarong or Phillips as a best 22 player. The Melbourne Footy Club had two games. They lost their first one to Richmond by four goals before they then beat Carlton by 38 points in their second clash. Notable points. I mean, we saw Clayton Oliver in the first one. He's still a chance to play round one. I don't think they've either ruled it out or confirmed it. We'll see what happens there. But the fact that he played in that game and performed all right is a really positive step. I mean, we talked about Cozzy Pickett's time in the midfield. Again, similar to Rankin, impact on Baller as well as being a good small forward. That could really give them a weapon if he can play there consistently. But other than that, you know, Max Gorn was dominant against Carlton. That's hardly a shock. But Caleb Windsor was very eye-catching and produced two awesome goals. You can lock him in for round one, I would have thought. And then Christian Salem as well played as a bit more of an inside midfielder against Carlton, which is interesting. He had 23 touches, nine tackles. We also saw Tom Sparrow thrive in this role, a bit more midfield time for him. And obviously, you know, with uncertainty of Clayton Oliver's availability and Angus Brayshaw's retirement, these guys stepping up to potentially fill that hole will be very positive. Let's talk about North. They had a very good preseason on the surface. Obviously, it's only preseason, but you can't complain at all with how they've gone about it. And they beat Collingwood by 34 points in their first performance. A big feature for me is their, their drive off half back. You know, Sheasel obviously was outstanding last year, but you add in Colby McKercher, who's shown some really good signs and has the tools to perform well, and Zach Fisher, who performed very strongly, particularly in their second game against St Kilda. Fisher had 36 touches in that game. Sheasel had 32, and this could really be a feature of North Melbourne's game going into 2024, and I'm kind of excited for them. The forwards did fire, particularly against Collingwood. We saw Larky kick five. We saw Curtis kick four. In the second game, we've seen Zane Dersma bob up with two goals as well. So a lot to be excited with, although that has come at the cost of Jai Simkin getting concussed. Now, I have no idea the extent of the severity. They're obviously not playing opening round, so in theory, he could come back after the concussion protocols, I think. That being said, he was concussed twice last year, so just fingers crossed, hoping for the best for Jai Simkin. Then we've got the power. Like I said, there was that preseason showdown that ended in a draw. I think the biggest story out of that was Sam Palpepper with his big hit on Keane, ruling him out for the next four weeks, or at least the first four games of 2024. So that is a big blow from a personnel point of view. Other than that, they look very strong against Fremantle in particular with Connor Rosie stepping up in the absence of Butters. I think Butters rolled an ankle but should be okay for round one. We saw Rosava Radaglia, probably the best performed of Port Adelaide's new recruits as a defender albeit against a depleted Fremantle forward line. But generally speaking, their pressure was immense. They looked relatively round one ready and we did see guys like Jackson Mead in the midfield step up. Jace Burgoyne as well. These guys will be fighting for spots in round one. So overall, I think Port Adelaide can be somewhat satisfied with their offseason. Aside from the fact that Pal Peppers ruled out for four weeks, he is an important player to their forward line. Then we have the Tigers who beat Melbourne by four goals in that first fixture and had some really good standouts from the usual suspects. We saw Bolton kick four goals. We saw Bolter move forward and kick three goals in three quarters as a forward. That is exceptionally positive. And I have liked the look of guys like Steely Green, who I've talked about on other videos on this channel. Against Collingwood, it was a bit more of a subdued performance, but the accuracy in front of goal did hold them back. They were at one stage leading one goal seven to one behind. The usual suspects played well. Like I said, Bolton four goals, Bolter three goals, but Dustin Martin against Collingwood was good, as was Prestia, Taranto, Daniel Rioli off halfback. Naismith also bobbed up and suggested if Nan Curvis is not fit for round one, Naismith could come in and play a role in round one, but there are some other injury concerns. Obviously, we know Tom Lynch is fighting to get back for opening round. I'm not too sure exactly where that sits right now, but there is some doubt. And they did lose Jack Ray into a quad injury in their second game as well, and he's been ruled out for the next five weeks. So that is an unfortunate blow. We're up to the Sydney Swans, and a uh, potentially indifferent and chaotic offseason. The injuries to their midfield is starting to pile up. We know Callum Mills is already out. Luke Park has broken his arm. And Taylor Adams, after winning seven clearances against Brisbane in the first like half or something like that, has also done a knee injury. And I think he's going to be out for three to four weeks. So we're seeing a depleted Sydney midfield here, but I do like their 
depth and I will highlight as well James Jordan is a very timely recruit for them 31 disposals and nine marks on the wing he's obviously playing in that wing role but still it's nice to have a midfield reinforcement when you consider they've got three of their best midfielders out Brody Grundy showed enough signs to suggest he could have a good year for the Swans again not too much to read into in terms of preseason but as far as team news goes I know that they rested Papley and Warner for the game against Brisbane Jake Lloyd also didn't play with a sore hit but as far as I know all should be available for opening round St Kilda had a fairly decent preseason set of games they beat Essendon by 11 goals and then they beat North Melbourne by three goals now as for strong performance Darcy Wilson looks like an absolute lock for round one he was prominent against Essendon and I think he had 24 touches in their second game amongst a few other youngsters who perform well Windhager did break his hand against Essendon but I believe it's been reported he should be available for round one and we saw a lot of the usual suspects perform well for the Saints but Riley Bonner having 30 touches as a delisted free agent from Port Adelaide that is a nice bonus for them in addition to Wilson playing well and even Ari Schoenmaker as well late draft pick from last year's draft came in and had 16 disposals I'm not sure how likely it is he plays round one but you know with the absence of now Jimmy Webster who's going to collect a pretty sizable suspension you'd think they're going to have to find a replacement so that's probably the biggest negative here for St Kilda was Jimmy Webster's inexplicable decision to jump and collect Jai Simkin high it's not like they don't have depth in those positions you know there's Starko there's Bonner but still that's probably the biggest downside for St Kilda this preseason then we've got the West Coast Eagles who put in two fairly indifferent performances against Fremantle and Adelaide one was a 52 point loss and the other a 67 point loss well beaten in both contests two much stronger sides again as a team that just won the wooden spoon assessing on those margins you know that those are pretty much what you'd expect from those games so what Eagles fans would have been looking for this preseason is signs of a difference in game plan and we probably didn't see that against Fremantle and we saw improvements in some key metrics against the Crows namely tackles and inside 50 count but in terms of young standouts you know Harley Reid after a fairly quiet game against Fremantle he was certainly named in the best against the Crows he had 20 touches and five clearances Brady Hoff has also been a standout for the Eagles this preseason we saw Jeremy McGovern return Turn to the team and perform really well against Adelaide. Tim Kelly was a bit of a workhorse. Jake Waterman's come back into contention for that round one side. But overall, you know, not a particularly compelling preseason for West Coast. And finally, we've got the Western Bulldogs who played Hawthorne twice. One was a 25-point victory and the other a 57-point victory. As far as positives goes, you know, one of them is Sam Darcy. I think he, coming into this side, playing a bit of a second ruck role, performed pretty strongly and he's getting to that age now where we can probably start to expect a bit more impact at AFL level given he's a tall, skinny raw prospect but kicking three goals in the first game against Hawthorne is a massive positive sign as for the second one you know I think that's where we saw the more usual suspects in Bonds and Pelly have a massive day out he had 32 touches and six clearances Liberatore and Trelaw also performed strongly in the midfield as did Riley Sanders who was outstanding with 30 touches so if there was any doubts over the Western Bulldogs midfield in the absence of someone like a Bailey Smith it is only pre-season but I think we, there's certainly a restored confidence about how that midfield mix is going to work the forwards fired particularly in the second game Norton and Jamal could be a very dangerous key forward combo this year. There's absolutely heaps of potential with those two. They kick four goals each and Riley West also kicked three goals. As for team news, I think the only thing that came across my attention is James O'Donnell, who is possibly going to be an important player as a key back. He rolled an ankle in the first game against Hawthorne, but I can't find an update as to whether anything came from that. Anyway, guys, this video went longer than I expected, but I uh, tried my best to summarize every team in the AFL's preseason. Let me know what you got out of this preseason for your club or any other observations. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.